<coughs> dear friends, first of all, I apologize if any of my bad back, that's why I'm so uh, limping. But I was really looking forward to this event tonight. I had the pleasure of also to be invited to Reggio Calabria uh, a few months ago in May. I could not attend it, but made it very clear that I was fascinated by this project. With this book, Monte Verisa, a study of peasant society and culture in southern Italy, by Jan Berger, this book, which was now translated into Italian with the title Uno studio sulla società e cultura contadina del sud Italia. I had the pleasure to meet you personally, Budi. She graced us with her presence at an event at the Italian Embassy, in which I could announce that, yes, indeed, we are very much interested in this piece of uh, scholar research in, in southern Italy. And why is that so? Italy, as uh, you know, is like Norway, a multifaceted country. Every tiny little bit of Italy is different from the other, has its unique features, unique characteristics, and Calabria is wonderful in its own right. Calabria is a wonderful crossroad of Latin and Greek civilization. It's really in the center of the Mediterranean, has a long history spanning for 3,500 years, probably. Pythagoras, you know, the great philosopher and uh, mathematician, was actually a son of the Calabrian land. In the Middle Ages, Joachim from Fiore was one of the mystical prophets uh, of the early Middle Ages. Corraro Alvaro, recently, is one of the leading Italian uh, poets, uh, writers. Uh, what else? Gioia Tauro today is probably the largest container port in the Mediterranean. The new uh, highway, what we call now, uh, we used to call uh, the uh, uh, highway of, of, uh, of the sunshine, uh, linking Milan to the, the tip of, uh, of Italy, is a new uh, feature uh, of engineering, which is uh, wonderful. And then personally, I traveled in Calabria by bicycle, went up and down the hills because it's very mountainous. I uh, have snow up there, and you have enjoy can enjoy beautiful uh, American landscape. So, in in a sort of uh, way, Calabria is a good uh, summing up of Italy. And don't forget that the very name Italy in the beginning was limited to the southern part of Calabria. That was Italia, and then from there on, the name Italy spread and was uh, extended to Sicily and uh, to the Rome, Milan, and, and the rest of and the rest of the country. Uh, one feature which is absolutely unique and wonderful is the survival of the Greek language in Calabria, uh, a language which is protected by the Italian state today, as uh, uh, Matteo Fazzi recalled, along with other eleven minority languages, and it is really um, a testimony to the very long history of. Uh, of this region. Now Calabria is of course evolving. Calabria today is not what it used to be 50 years ago when uh, Jan Berger and Budil travel, travel there. But it's very important to remember what we were, where we come from, and to take stock of uh, the beautiful and positive side of our heritage. That's why I'm really uh, looking forward to the proceedings of tonight, dear curator, dear professor, the representative of Calabria itself. And without further ado, I leave the word to uh, uh, the animator of tonight, not without thanking Matteo Fazzi and the Culture Institute once more for a very intense, beautiful program he's putting up, uh, and always uh, with uh, uh, great availability to the suggestions of uh, the Italian Embassy, of which is an essential component. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for this introduction and for coming here for this event. And thank you to the Institute and to the Director for hosting this event. My name is Harald Lasten. I'm uh, an Associate Professor of Social Anthropology at the University in... No, it's not the University of Trondheim anymore. It's the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And luckily, we still have a Department of Social Anthropology there. And that Department of Social Anthropology was established in 19, 1975 by the appointment of Professor Jan Berger. And I got to know Jan Berger five, five years after, later, in 1980, at the time when I joined, joined the university with the 
at that time, perhaps a bit curious ambition to become a social anthropologist. Uh, there were not that many of them that time. Jan Brugge became a long time teacher and gradually also a friend and a colleague in his capacity as a teacher, advisor, and mentor during the years that followed. In the early days of the Department of Social Anthropology in Trondheim, Jan Brugge was the only faculty member with a permanent position, and the few of us who joined the university to become students of social anthropology, we enjoyed a privileged position in the academic and social life of the department. Jan Brugge opened not only um, his seminar rooms and his professoral office for us, but also his, his home and his wife Budin and the six children also became natural parts of our network. And unfortunately, Jan Brugge died in 2006 just after he retired. The fieldwork in Boa, Boa, which was called Monte Varese in the original PhD dissertation and also in the published book uh, from 1971, it's dated from the Universitas Fadoria. The fieldwork sounds like an adventure today. In 1967, or six, was it? 1966. When Jan and his wife Budi traveled together with their twin daughters, four years old then, from Norway to the deep south of Italy in an old Volvo, and finally they established themselves in Bova Superiore. In May this year, Budi, Brugge, and I traveled together to Reggio Calabria and to Bova to celebrate the Italian edition of Monte Varese. This was 50 years after his, or I should rather say their, Jan's and Budin's fieldwork in Boga. And I think for Budin, it was certainly with a sense of nostalgia and recollection when she came back to, to Boga. But the same applied to me because I had always been convinced that I knew that book inside and out. That I had read the book and also that I had a copy of it in my private library. But when I started searching for it, um, I could not find it. Because probably I never read the book itself. I was asking colleagues, do you have a copy of Monte Varese? One of my one of the, he's now retired also, um, here in Adi. he said, I, I'm sure I have it, but he had moved and then, so, so I, I never got it, but I, I was able to find a copy of the um, book in the library and also a copy of the original dissertation from the University of Oslo. But the reason why it was so, I had the idea that I, I knew it and I read it, because the content of it, the analysis of a traditional peasant society in Southern Europe, it was very familiar to me. Um, and also to hundreds or, I think I could say, thousands of other students. Student numbers grew tremendously at the uh, University of Trondheim or generally in social anthropology during the 1980s from the handful uh, who started in 1980. So I knew through Jan Brugger's freshman introduction courses to social anthropology. We have, we have a copy here of a book that he wrote as a base of these lectures. I will use the role of the role theory. And much of the material in that book is also from his uh, Bova or Monte Varese study. Through these lectures and, and uh, books, we learned about a society <coughs> in which money had little impact, where kinship regulated access to resources and position, and where the nature of <coughs> interdependence among its members created conceptions and actions 
related to witchcraft, Malocchio, and Vendetta, and other things also. We learned about the relationship between ecology and social structure, subsistence agriculture, and female seclusion. Many of the issues that Jan brought forward from his field material in Boga could have appeared strange and exotic, but he managed to make them strangely familiar. We saw that human feelings and patterns of behavior had idiosyncratic expressions that were basically universal. So he made us understand without judging. It is now three years since um, I got a letter from a Swiss anthropologist I've never heard about before. Uh, he wrote to me because at that time I was head of the department and he wrote to me and asked about who has the rights to do this book by Jan Breger called Montevarese from, from southern Italy. Uh, and that was Dr. Moritz Glasner who, who approached us and I forwarded his um, letter to Budi and uh, three years later um, uh, the book is there in an Italian edition. So, um, and this is the reason why we are here and we will hear more about the book, um, how it came about both in the original from Budi but also about the uh, Italian edition. <coughs> And it is a special pleasure for me that both to have been able to travel to, to Bova to get the Budi. And last week we had seminars in Trondheim about the book, also together with Budi. Because Budi has always, did always stand entirely by her husband's side through all his academic work if it was in exotic environments or at his desk. So I take this event uh, not only as an opportunity to celebrate Jan Brugge and his authorship, but also to mark the value of deep ethnographic studies. It is still valid insights 50 years after. I'm sure it will be of great interest for the new generations in Bova to read about their society of their parents and grandparents, and perhaps they may discover traits in their daily lives that have persisted despite the profound changes in economy and lifestyle. And when the Italian edition was presented to the people in Reggio and in Bova, it was obvious that the ethnographic details, but also the analysis of the society 50 years ago, was something that engaged people still today. And this is what we'll hear more about now. First from Udin, and then from the two other scholars who have edited and translated the work that forms the Italian edition of Montavaresa, Moris Krasnak and Giuseppe Giancia. Now first I will give the word to Udin. This is 
a picture of Bova today, taken from above. And you can see some of the houses. You can see the landscape, which is not easily cultivated for agriculture. And you can see Etna in the background. When we heard that, uh, my husband heard that there were some Greek speaking uh, peasants up in the mountains, he decided that maybe we should try to go there. And it's a very long, very uh, uh, winding uh, uh, street up there, very steep. But when we came into to the, the piazza, we were sort of Shanghai. No. He went into the cafe at the corner that you can see at the, at the right hand corner there, and he met a very nice person. No. Uh, who understood that we wanted to stay there and maybe we could make a door a little if we stayed there. So the first night we stayed in this Baron's palace. I don't remember what which Baron. Baron Baron It's Neshi, yeah. And then he rented us a house that belonged to his nephew and got us installed. And I mean that's okay. We okay what we should but it was a very great great help to have him as a kind of guarantee for the other people because he was very much interested in history, culture, and especially the Greek language. So he thought, originally thought my husband was going to, to study that. The man in black there, I will not talk very much about him, but he was the son of one of the family we got very good, good contact with, but the family had great problems. With the, with the sister and the terrible husband, who was shot in, on the, in the middle of the street in Virtue, and uh, Pietro was arrested, and he spent 16 years in jail. But it was really his, his brother who had shot him. And according to Pietro, he didn't know anything before, before this shooting. And we never know why. He didn't tell, but the brother was in great trouble with the police before, so maybe that was what made him do it. And now he's emigrated to Switzerland. He came down for this presentation, but I was so afraid while he was there, and I was so happy when he got back to Switzerland. <laughs> We went all the way from Bergen, as I have said, in, in this Volvo station wagon. And uh, all through southern Italy, my husband looked for, for um, places to stay, but he didn't fancy anyone uh, until we reached this, <laughs> this uh, town high up in the mountains. You, you can see where it is in, in Italy on the map, it's marked with red. Well, that's the piazza where we, it was not exactly, uh, uh, the details are different, but um, mm -hmm. the houses are still there. <coughs> so we got this contact with this Marisciano Salvatore Messiano, who had been an officer in Mussolini's army, and I think he still regretted that he had, that he had lost. And then the family by us and lots of others, because you have to get to know people and have to get them to tell this kind of secrets to be able to describe this, the society where they're living. This is a picture of the couple Varese. He was a farmer out in the countryside, but he had also 
made some money from the mes Casa de, mes Casa de Mesa Joyne, who built houses for the poor in, in southern Italy after the war, after Mussolini. The, the way anthropologists work mostly, maybe not all of them right after, after a while, but at that time, you just lived among the people. Of course, you tried to read as much as you could beforehand, but you just tried to see what happened. And of course, you could take census and try to count something, but mostly you, you just had to be there and be observant and write down. And maybe you write down something you don't understand, but then a year, a, a month later, you say, oh, this, this happened and you can go back. So the method was just this field work to live there among the, these people. And the, the goal was to get a doctorate so he could get a position because he had a stipend, I don't know, a fellowship from the University of Bergen with Philip Park, who's the, the real great Norwegian social anthropologist. And you, he could have chosen uh, places in Africa or Asia or the in Southern America in Indians. But he, because before, that was what, what anthropologists did uh, before Maxwell's time. But now they had started new studies of, of societies around Mediterranean, so he, he just chose Italy. So now we were settled in the house and uh, tried to get everything in, in order. So this is the street with the two children. And this uh, is very, it's 850 to 900 meters above sea, sea level. So it's very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter, five degrees above zero and no heating. So, but we, we survived. <laughs> <laughs> but you can also see the landscape, uh, the olive trees, the grain, the, the wheat fields, and they also had uh, white stocks and to make uh, some uh, to make wine. And they also had some fruit trees and, and of course they had tomatoes and broccoli and salad and lots of other things. But this was all for their own use. The wheat, the olive oil and the wine, they had to share with the, the owner of the land if, if they didn't own the the land themselves. But it was a sort of mix because there had been big landowners who had gradually sold out to, to the farmers in small pieces. And of course they had some some animals, mostly sheep and goats, uh, some cows too, they had cheese and uh, they got down this kind of thing. But the land was the land that it was possible to cultivate was mostly cultivated, but there were lots of uh, strips of land between where they they it was just too barren, so they, it, it was just bush. This is uh, a gathering during the the wheat. Uh, with harvest, harvest, then you had to gather neighbors and maybe some relatives to help you because you had to do it in a few days and even worse with wine. And then you had to feed them and uh, so they would be happy. But of course you had to return, you had to, some of your family had to go and help the others. Were you hidden in the shadow? 
Pardon? Yeah. You know, with the twins? Um, you always have twins in the shadow, yes. <laughs> This was because they were living, they were not living in the clan. Uh, uh, um, the land was not owned in, in common with, with many from one family. They moved, when they married, they moved uh, where there was available land. So that means that you have to get somebody nearby to help you and you have to be in good standing with them because otherwise they wouldn't help you. And of course they were, they were very, uh, the, almost, you couldn't drive out there, you had to go by, by, um, uh, donkey. And, uh, and no, it, it was a harsh life, and very little money. And of course they had their religious life. This is from a profession, procession inside the, the town. You can see that they had their own bishop, a very small bishopric, and, and I think it's a Franciscan. And, and uh, most of the, the women went to church, but the men were also strong believers. But uh, of course when there was trouble, they could go to, to a lady who, who knew how to undo the malocchio and, and things by oil and, and uh, you had, I think you had, what, I forgot, you had, I think you had water and put some oil and then you read. And you had some prayers to, for, to help people and to try to sort out their problems. This is also part of, of the church life. They had to go to in, into the center, to the churches there, to get married. And this is a bride on her way, with her father, of course. And this is very strict. You have to be very pure. If, uh, if somebody had been engaged to another man, she would not be, and he broke up. She had no chance with another man. So many of them became the sempstresses, Sarita. So you can see, there is the, one of them. I think she's got the scissors or something, so she can repair the dress while they're walking into, this, into the center. So what did, what, did people think of us? In this new book, there is Pierre de Valles has written about his reaction when we came because we were so strange. Academic from the north with all our ideas. And quite a lot of them thought we were spies because there was nothing to, 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 to use there. So we were not from a foreign country and we are not spies for the Italian government, finance or taxes or anything. But they couldn't make it out why we were there. Because they had, didn't understand that people went around and wrote about different societies. It was no really by coincidence that my husband came to do field work in Italy. He had been down there, I think the first time was he went with a, uh, a, a friend and the mother of a friend. And they came all the way down to, to Rome, Pantheon. And he was very, uh, he thought about, uh, a lot about Italy. Also because when his father and mother married, his, father was at that time a very young author he had, uh, he had published one or two books I think and they, he took his new wife to uh, Capri, to Anna Capri and they stayed there for a couple of years and Jan's elder brother was born there <laughs> and then they moved to Paris and Jan was born there in 1936. <laughs> 
So uh, I just found out that even his great grandfather went there in 1876. He went to to collect the first time he went to Elba from France to collect stones. But he came down there to study volcanoes and other things. Uh, this one, well, the Marcus of Bergi is the cultural hero. He's the one who started the uh, academic uh, career of the Bergi family. So the Geological Museum at Feyen is named after him, Bergi Schuss. <coughs> what did come out of this? Of course, it's the... Uh, It's this book. Which was read by some and uh, which my husband used very much. And he also wrote some articles in a scientific journal. And he also, as you have heard already heard, he he used his material among he, he did three big field works one in Ethiopia and one in Portugal and and the first one was in Boba. But he and of course he would use examples for, from other people's works too. But Boba always figured like had a great part of, of his material. And as as I told you so many students have heard about him, about this town. And he also uh, had uh, lectures for, for um, social workers. Pardon? Social workers? Social no, this BDIFT means, means uh, uh, firms, enterprises. enterprises, firms. And uh, also he wrote lots of articles in newspapers and magazines, and he also talked on the radio and TV, and he often used Boba in those instances. And of course, this many students at the University of Trondheim will have to write exams on many subjects from, from, this, um, from this work. And I just discovered when we came to Trondheim uh, on, on Thursday that the students are still reading about this case. And but of course now it's changed a lot. It's so different. But they, 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 this is the ethnographic present. They think this like it was 50 years ago. Then came a new book on minorities in in Europe. He had the idea that he would put, go to different minorities all over Europe, and write. But first, he wrote many articles in the newspaper, on um, the local newspaper, and he traveled with uh, with an, an artist. He wrote. Car caricatures for the newspaper every day, but he also did some marvelous drawings from, from these travels. And this is when the book was, was uh, I'm forgetting. And then came the big surprise, because uh, Maurice Karasnak found the book when he, he is living in in uh, in, in Boma, and he managed to um, have it uh, translated, and he found lots of other materials like Julian Eriksson's memorial for my husband, and he made me and Pietro write pieces each of our impressions of how it was living there 
and some more photographs too. And the picture, he, Marius got lots of other people to to help him, but especially uh, Giuseppe Chanchan. He was very important also to to have, to get this uh, finalized. So the lecture, the picture to the right is the picture I got from Giuseppe Chanta with the words, the book is out. <laughs> because I've been there. Well, it's not, you had really worked the hard to, to, to get it done. And so now another uh, other results are of course an article by these two in the Norwegian Anthropological as a Norsk Anthropologist Tidskrift. And we have these um, exhibitions at the uh, Archivo di Stato in, in Neagio and now a new exhibition at the University Library in Drama. And we have uh, these seminars for students and the teachers at the university. And we have this uh, we have this <laughs> lecture today. <laughs> I, I, I could say more about what the people felt when when we came back and we, they had this book and could read. But I think um, uh, uh, Mars will say more about that. This is just a quote from uh, the, the press release saying that the, the peasants were so surprised that my husband didn't want to study the elite but wanted to study the road people and of course my husband knew the elite more or less I mean but he he wanted just to, to know what was going on uh, between the, the peasants and this is another uh, citation. Uh, my husband says that uh, he traveled with this, is it artist? Tiny? Dora? And he, he, he was left wing in many ways. And they had very interesting discussions <laughs> during the travels. And they could disagree heartily, but they really enjoyed the, their. The, the, the company of each other, and uh, I have, maybe I can read it in in Norwegian. We have gotten the time. Okay, <laughs> one one more. <laughs> That's the one. This is a picture of uh, of books that my husband has written, or uh, written part of, and of course. Montevideo's in different versions are part of that book. Thank you. Thank you, Budi. Uh, I'm sorry for the alarm. Went up <laughs> after 15 minutes, which I agree that was a very good time. Uh, we may have time afterwards also for, for questions and uh, more discussion. But first, uh, I would like to say that it, it has been acknowledged that, uh, and also Jan acknowledged that in, in Polkutenland, particularly in the chapter on Bova, and we revisited Bova in 2000 uh, for the article first in the newspaper, then in the book, that had it not been for your presence and your participation together with him as as his wife, as the mother of their children, he would, part of the society in Boa would have been closed for him. It was more open for you and, and it was made him, or made the book richer because of the insights you could provide on, on the theme, women's world in, in Boa at that time. Now, this was 50 years ago and uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Moritz Kvasnak to, to tell us about the motivations for why, why is it still important, why is it 
important to to do the book available for for the people that are concerned that have been studied and uh, to do that in their own language. Innanzitutto vorrei ringraziare il direttore dell'Istituto per l'ospitalità di oggi che abbiamo l'occasione di presentare questo libro. And switching to English, um, I'd like to say that uh, we won't be able uh, to tell you all about uh, Calabria or Southern Calabria in this case. But I'd like to stress on uh, our motivation for the publication of the Italian edition. For that, uh, I have to tell you quite a bit about uh, the Southern Calabria a region with big contrast in the landscape, as you will see afterwards in the pictures of Giuseppe, but also in society. Calabria is the poorest, uh, the poorest uh, uh, region in Italy. It's the uh, most religious, maybe, uh, but even the most violent. Not violent in our daily life, but also as far as statistics and homicides, uh, for example, are concerned. So often we refer to Calabria saying it's an unlucky region. Well, besides every Orientalism, um, we have to stress the fact that Calabria is an integral part of Christian Europe. Uh, anthropologists uh, for decades uh, put it away to with North Africa, with Turkey, with Spain, uh, with Greece, uh, the Mediterranean region for its own. But I would stress it's Christian Europe. Calabria had always a weak state and powerful local barons and landlords. And Italy as a whole, up to Second World War, was majorly an agricultural country. <coughs> and Calabria, uh, since then, or our southern Calabria, has now industrialization. Fifty years ago, agriculture in our area was very important for peasants. It is not anymore. The sea in the mountains, you can't compare in grain production with the US. It's not possible. So we don't have this type of agriculture anymore. Our area doesn't produce nearly anything. If you disappear today or tomorrow from the surface, uh, nobody will notice that. 30% uh, of the income uh, is from the Italian state. Transfer, transfer even from the uh, European community. We have a, I mentioned, we have a high degree of violence and there's the name of Mafia, which is important. Our Mafia, the Drangheta, it's a Greek term, huh? made out of Andros men and Agathia uh, of value, uh, honorable men. And this problematic only the tip of the iceberg. But it also to be mentioned that our mafia is the main cocaine dealer and the best cocaine dealer in, in Europe. And this is even part of our income. And due to this mafia problem, uh, nobody invests in Calabria. Or let's say uh, nearly nobody. Um, what Jan Rogge 
described uh, 50 years ago was a result of 200 years of uh, feudalism, feudal, semi-feudalism, and our client, parent, patron uh, relations we still have are the result of a, a long period of violence, which is even which is in corruption today. Uh, but, uh, the employed um, passes through other people. Uh, if you have a diploma or not, you can become somebody in a hospital. If you want to teach, you go to maybe uh, someone of the trade union. You will pay him a sum and he will guarantee you something and every month and for years you will have to pay him a certain amount. How react people um, to all of this? Maybe the part, most of the people will react with fatalism, maybe with feelings of impotence, we can't do anything. And uh, people now notice this relative poverty of Southern Calabria and this relative backwardness with a feeling of guilt, maybe a um, Christian feeling of guilt and uh, inferiority sometimes. The reaction is mainly, well, we are make victims, victims of mafia, the state doesn't help us. We are victims of uh, these earthquakes that destroyed our land. We are victims of uh, the flutes uh, which destroyed our houses and we are victims of all the evil of the world. And others will maybe say, well, we are victims of the unification of Italia because uh, the North uh, didn't allow us uh, to develop. No? And uh, maybe uh, a romantic burden uh, that were born in uh, rule and they refer maybe to Marx, but he uh, wrote about India that the British. Uh, uh, made a infanticide uh, uh, under the uh, Indian industry, and the same happened to us. Uh, a lot of people in our area will compensate uh, these feelings of inferiority, emphasizing Greek culture, and say, oh, "Yeah, we are not Italian. Uh, we are something better. We are uh, of noble origins. We are from Magna Grecia." Uh, of uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, we maintained the Greek idiom, we maintained, uh, they refer to Homer and Pythagoras, and uh, saying Pythagoras was Calabrese, which I don't think is true, but uh, the whole village changed its name to Samo, uh, on this uh, idea that Pythagoras is from Calabria. We will talk a little bit. Um, Valore della memoria storica, the value of historical memory, and all of this is intertwined with a lot of interests of uh, associations to get money from the state. So there's uh, some is true, some is not true. What they say, the power Greek is not ancient Greek, but we have a continuity of Greek, let's say, for 2,000 years and more, to 2,500. Yes. Uh, others will stress on local values uh, and they would uh, mainly name La Familia. Yeah? Family as an uh, important value, even if there's a uh, value of hospitality, even, even if uh, family values developed in the last 300 years in this form, they are not so old, they are basically Christian. And other people since uh, 150 years just immigrate. So, uh, publishing this book, which is dated, it's, it's old, it's 50 years old, is an attempt. Uh, it wants to be a contribute to a discussion. It wants to open this discussion. Who are we? Why are we in this way? How did we become this way? How did our values develop? 
So the process leading to something like self-conscious in order to find a successful and very own way maybe uh, a very successful and very own access uh, to the modern world. Then personally I ran into this book during my research and I've been living for well, I know Boba for 20 years, I've been living 12 years at Boba in a family, in a Calabrese family and uh, all of what uh, Jan Berger describes in this book corresponds perfectly to what I know even about the old times, uh, 50 years ago and um, so it's, it's true what I, what I read there then <coughs> this book covers a period from about 150 years uh, from 1800 to 1950, 70, which is very important for Calabrese history and uh, he at the last moment, in the last moment, he was able to describe this kind of economy, this kind of uh, uh, society and culture and this is a historical document uh, because uh, these are our grandfathers and fathers who lived in these uh, conditions. So in embryo, uh, in this old book, we see conditions we still have nowadays in the values and the basic convictions in the cosmology and the concept of our neighbor, the other people and how functions society about uh, man and woman. Uh, Calabria changed a lot, we had television, now we have the internet, uh, all the young people have a smartphone, uh, we are part of the modern world, but still <coughs> our values, our way to look to the others is uh, very much, um, has not very much to do with these old times. We cut off the theoretical part of the book, um, because this is uh, obsolete. Uh, but this uh, does not uh, want to say that the anthropologist working with obsolete uh, theories once uh, could not do uh, good work. Um, there, the Andrega, and this is in every page of the book, had a very big sympathy with uh, these uh, Bovesi, Bovishani in dialecto. Uh, he was humanly very close to them. Uh, so even with a wrong theory, if you are so close to them, you will adapt theory. Because uh, if you're close to people, by the time you're, at the time your hair is their ears, you feel the same thing, you see with their eyes and you can use your mirror neurons and understand them. Then the big quality is that the young Ragavan is not ideologic, as often happens. Um, so it's uh, acceptable. And we have a very strong point in this book, which is family, and this is due to the fact uh, that it's not just one anthropologist, but a couple of anthropologists. Uh, the presence of Bodil uh, was very important because at these times it would have been impossible uh, to get in touch, uh, to interview our uh, secluded women. Uh, they wouldn't have uh, told him anything. Uh, it was even <coughs> difficult to enter the houses. So, uh, uh, Bodil did, did a very good job in her daily life. She uh, had to do with all these uh, women. And uh, so, we have an insight in uh, family life, we have the insight in the transmission of uh, culture, in the education uh, process and uh, the relation between husband and wife. 
which uh, shows a lot. And uh, if we have the time, at the end, I'll read you uh, two passages, two little passages of the book, which um, are a little masterpiece uh, for me, uh, which are uh, the main reason uh, to, to publish this book. Another quality of the book is that it's readable because uh, a lot of our modern production is written in a editarian academic language and is not accessible uh, for laymen and normal people. And uh, the people I talked to, Boba, modest people, they could read it. They can't, uh, they can read it and uh, oh, but it's readable and I like to read it and I understand it and it's no problem. And they said, yeah, uh, it's what my, my, my grandfather told me, uh, it's a safe thing <laughs> and you can analyze it and this is uh, uh, quality. Uh, I lost myself in a moment. Yeah. And the major po point is where I have uh, this uh, outstanding sympathy. Uh, I'm going to go ahead for, for these people. Uh, we wrote it in the article that all these pores are open uh, to these uh, very simple uh, people, to these men with harsh manners, um, and very warm feelings. And this is uh, which makes this. Uh, it's a, big quality to this book and which makes it um, particularly fitting to our purpose to start a discussion on ourselves. Who we are we are living collaborator. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you, Moritz. Um, I, I think that um, you are right in... I, um, I remember some years ago when Jan Berger was there and uh, at the department, uh, we made an anthology to... It could have been a 20 years anniversary for the department, something like that. We made an anthology to try to capture the atmosphere of our department. Which I'm remember, remembering that the department was established by Jan Breger just after he published this book. And we called it uh, something like the Trondheim Connection, uh, a humanistic approach in anthropology. And I think the humanistic, the kind of humane kind of describing and, and having, coming close to people's worlds without judging them, is, is the quality that remains uh, distilled there and that makes it, uh, as you said, one of the, your biggest motivations for making it available to the local population to also to start uh, to have it as a, as a basis for, for, for a discussion about, uh, about heritage, about values, about uh, not only the past but also the future. And, um, now, three foreign anthropologists, or four, Jan and Budir from Norway, myself, Moritz Gassenlag from Switzerland, Germany, talking about Bova. Now we have another anthropologist, Calabrese anthropologist, who has been doing his field works in Mexico and in Bolivia, but then uh, through this the engagement with the, with the Italian edition, has become very much concerned and interested in, in the anthropology of Calabria. And uh, this is a Thank you.
Diane from Regio Calabria. Microphone. Microphone. If I can speak louder, maybe it's better. Yeah. Yes. Okay, it's now it's better. Um, I'm quite nervous uh, to tell you because um, I am the only one from Calabria today here, I guess. No? <laughs> And uh, it's true, I've been doing field work in Mexico and in Bolivia. I studied in Rome, then I studied also abroad. Uh, then four years ago I decided to come, go back, go back home, no matter what. Um, so I ended up there in a country which is true. It's not the ideal place to live. After, especially after you know you go outside, you go abroad, you live in the United States, you live in the UK, you live somewhere in Europe, then you decide to go back home. You decide to go back home on that, on that land that Maurizio described so well. Well, at the same time, I studied anthropology. And uh, anthropologists do not study, you know, do not make generalizations. Anthropologists love to study small communities. They love to, that's, that's the discipline, but it's also a tendency we have for small, for details, for quality instead of quantities. We don't write on tabloids, we don't hit the headlines. We live with people. We share their experiences and we do not judge them. We describe them because everybody has his own uh, good things and bad things everywhere in the world. And Calabria is not an exception to that. So, this is the. You know, also, I grew up in a family where all these things described and told by Maurice were not experienced. There are many people there in Calabria who live a normal life, who are proud of living a normal life. And I had this opportunity to live in a normal family, a normal life as an ordinary man, as many of us are living. Uh, these few pictures are just to mm, introduce you this this, because the visual thing is the best thing, I think, when you see what we're talking about. And uh, this is the tip of the boot. Reggio Calabri and all the Balkanic area. It's so remarkable that 50 years ago, a couple of Norwegian decided with their twins to take a car. No, you're listening. You can hear me, no? Mm -hmm. uh, decided to take a car and drive 3,500 kilometers down south. You know, they could have gone to Florence, they could have gone to Naples, I don't know, but they decided to go, I think you could have gone to Africa if you could. <laughs> you could. They went all the way down. And now, 50 years later, I'm here to discuss with you about a book written in my homeland by this couple. And after I discovered this book, thanks to Morris, and uh, I'm telling you, when I read this book, I felt so touched because I could see my infancy in this book. In Calabria, let's go ahead because otherwise, the fifty minutes. More than that. Okay, next, next picture. Uh, okay. You already said that Calabria uh, is one of the places in Italy where there is a minority uh, Greek language. Okay, and this is, you know, the, the pink and the uh, light blue are the regions where Greek was spoken in the few centuries ago. Then the people remained the same, but the Greek language shrinked. And nowadays it's just spoken in these red spots. But We'll see at the end of it, just a few people are speaking Greek, no more. But uh, in 1966, as we'll see, um, most of the farmers were speaking Greeks. I'm saying farmers, which is a detail that it's better if we keep in mind. 
Max. Let's see. Ok, this is Reggio Calabria. Reggio Calabria is by Sicily, that's the Etna. It's uh, the same size as Trondheim, almost 200,000 people living there. Another picture, this is the region where Jan and Bodil went, which is Bovesia. I want to show you something about this picture. Look at those towns. You see Boga up there, which is uphill. But then you have Boma, Boga Marina, which is by the sea. You notice that? You also have Kondofuri on the left. And you also have Kondofuri Marina. You can also find Palizzi on the right to Boga. And you also have Palizzi Marina. And there are others. San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Marina, Ardore, Ardore Marina, many of them. <laughs> And this is what he's telling us. He's telling us that people went down to the coast just recently. I mean, at the end of the 19th century. Because before that, the coast were not safe. Were not safe places to live. Since after the fall of the Roman Empire. These people was forced to leave their natural habitat, the sea, and go up to the mountains. So this is also another detail we have to keep in mind. And this kind of struggling, and this kind of living in a territory where, uh, I show you the picture, it's harsh. You see how difficult it is to live in those places. And you can tell it also by the way how these places were located. Next picture. Beautiful. Yes, using this word, beautiful. If you go to Calabria, it's a beautiful place. But we cannot use this word because at young Brewer's time, peasants Those places were everything but beautiful. This is Castello di Sant'Aniceto. It's a Norman fortification from year 2000. It was up there because the Arabs were menacing the coast. So they built this military place in this uh, environment here. That's Etna again. Another one. Pentidattio. It's, a, it's the most famous one in the region. It's a beautiful place also. It's called Pentidatilo, five fingers in Greece, because the rocks uh, which stands above it recalls the shape of five fingers. Pentidatilo. Rohudi, or Rohudi, as they say. Look where they were living. They could have chosen, uh, you know, they could have lived anywhere else, but I mean, they couldn't, <laughs> actually. <laughs> That's a torrent. A torrent is not a river. A torrent is dry during the summer, but could be deadly dangerous during the winter. So they could not live by the, the, uh, the torrent. There were no, there are no plains. They were just living, you know, everywhere they could, you know, to stay hidden by all these threats coming from outside. And also, this is still, we are approaching Bova. This is Bova, which is beautiful, as you can see. The Etna is still on the background. You can see Etna from almost everywhere in Calabria. The, 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 middle, the, the southern part of Calabria, you can see Etna everywhere from everywhere. This is a Lombard Tower. That's Maurizio's house, too. I have to say that. And uh, look at the hills behind. Look how harsh is the territory. How steep are the slopes. And how could people, how could people get a living out of it? This is still Boba from another perspective. This is the same picture. Okay, I'm going fast. So look at this territory. How they were living. The farmers that Jan Breger studied were living scattered in, uh, around Bova, 
some of them, some others were living in town, in Boa itself. But every day they had to move for a few hours, also for four, four hours in a few occasions, to the field, to work the field. And then come back at night, every day, back and forth, back and forth. And they could just, you know, look at these terraces. You see this? Now they are bounded. They were making wine there, they were making, you know, vegetables, <laughs> they were in some other fields, they were cultivating grains and wheat and anything. But what young Breggers, from the economic point of view, described so well and very well was the how the economic uh, uh, subsistence form of economic. They couldn't think of opening, you know, a, a market because the production was so low. It was just enough for them to live. And when they started, they rented the land from the landowner. Land owner. They collected money, saved money for a life long. They could buy small pieces of land, but then they had so many children that when they were dead, those children, they were to start from scratch again. So the, they could not improve their lives. And this is what Young Gregors has explained, in my opinion, so well. It explains, you know, even if it doesn't speak historically, this is a clue to understand the history of the region. You know what I mean? Okay, I'm almost done, I think. This is still another example of terraces, you see. I saw this kind of terraces in the Andes, around Lake Titicaca. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're doing the same kind of technology. Okay, uh, Jan Breger. Mm -hmm. It's not the first one, it's the second one. Mm -hmm. He was, how old was he? He was 30 years old. 30 years, yeah. yes, 30 years. I was born during their field work. <laughs> okay, and uh, great harvest, living together. And uh, um, these people were modest, it's true. They were modest because they were living a modest life, but they were, they were normal people. They, uh, I'm sure he felt sympathy for them. But also, it was very analytical and very clear when he was describing their lives. It was not conditioned by their, the sympathy he had for, for them. He was an anthropologist. So he was, you know, distancing from them. When you write about them, you have to take a distance from them in order to explain better, to give the, something better back to the reader. And this is what it... He did, but this picture tells tell what how nice was. Uh, I think you really enjoyed it there, both of those yes, times, you know. And I'm sure right now, you know, those small, those few families which are still staying there, they share the same feelings. If you go there, if I also go back there, the hospitality is still is still the same. Um, the wedding. We'll discuss about this, Maurizio, I think, later after me, right after me, the, rela uh, the relationship between men and women. We just decided that both, um, Jan Breger covered all aspects of society, almost all aspects of society, but we decided to concentrate on the relationship between men and women, which is, um, you know, an excerpt, a quote from the book, which is a masterpiece. As he moved to the other day, it's a great piece of literature. Uh, okay, uh, what happened? Now, Boba today, modernity to cover. People from Boba at the young Breggers' time, there were 2,000 people living there. Nowadays, one tenth, just 200. They all left. They left because they prefer to live along the coast. They want a better life. We cannot tell them anything, right? And uh, nothing has left, I mean, ruins. Everything is abandoned, almost everything. With Arald, we met a guy who was 19 years old, the last farmer, 19 years old. He was coming back from the field at dusk, and a, a friend of us called us, look, look, there is the last one. <laughs> and we stopped him, and we talked with him, and you know what? He had two son a son and a daughter, 
there is a doctor and an engineer, I guess, in Milan. And this guy was still walking the slopes back home, you know? Yes, I'm finished. Okay. Uh, okay. Today, what is left? Tracking. Uh, the Greco I paesi grecophony, you know, they uh, appropriated, I don't know if we speak up, we'll talk about it, but for the farmers, uh, speaking Greek was a matter of, they were ashamed of it. But then when they discovered that Greek was, whoa, we are the, we are the real heirs of the classic Greek. So now they're promoting Greek. But the problem is that there is no anybody speaking Greek anymore. <laughs> That's the problem. So this is new small local museum uh, websites about Bovesia where they speak uh, uh, Greek. And the last thing, <laughs> the last thing is great. This is the problem. Two reasons as to be as to have a context. If you don't have a context. If you, if you promote tourism in a vacuum, or if you just put a locomotive in a place where the railway, Boba, that's in Boba, where at 900 meters above the sea level, and you put a locomotive, you know, and there's a tourist attraction, it's true. But who goes there? I say, but what's, uh, what's the point with this thing? And this is the result of a very short-sighted politics. That, that's the problem. Because you cannot think of just because you have the opportunity to buy or bring a locomotive to a place forgotten by God, and they had to, to enlarge the street to bring this locomotive up to the view. This is the, I think, the icon of the problem we have there. This locomotive. Thank you very much. I think you had, uh, um, I think both of you, you wanted to, to read a small piece from the book about family or yeah. husband wife before we open for discussion, please. Yeah. You too. Well, it's about uh, violence and rebellion. And uh, the example is taken from family life. Mm -hmm. Husband and wife never demonstrate affection in the presence of other family members. Male authority, however, is frequently emphasized in their interaction. The husband requires domestic services from his wife with little apparent consideration for the other task she is involved in or whether she is tired or not. If they get involved in an argument, she may tell her to be silent. And he often settles the disagreement by power rather than persuasion or logic. The wife may respond with a subdued grumble, addressed to the wall rather than to the husband, but he will rarely be provoked by her muted soliloquy. He grants her his doubtful freedom of speech and obviously accepts as a tribute to his status that at least she does not talk back. But this is only the dysfunctional aspect of their relationship. A wife will perhaps most of the time accept her status with a quiet, quiet dignity and not without satisfaction. Not all wives resent the maleness of their husbands, and many may even be proud of it. In relationships marked by this admiration, Paired with some consideration from the husband, the brighter side of the Calabrese matrimony is expressed, while this kind of living up to cultural expectation and contemporary interaction is not in accordance with urban European suffragette ideology, 
is a testimony to the fact that even the expression of love is determined by a cultural system and cannot be probably appreciated without the knowledge of certain basic cultural premises. Cultural premises in the novel. Ideally, the content of the husband-wife relationship in Monte Valverde can be described with reference to male dominance. It is explicitly stated that it is a wife's duty to obey her husband. A husband who is dominated by his wife is ridiculed or pitied and has a low standing in the community. Woe to the house where a woman commands is a frequently quoted proverb. The complementary virtue of female submission was avoided also because of economic limitations and, and uh, cultural ideas and uh, other ways to vent frustration and conflict than open aggression or open opposition. Yes, please. My question is also for, for her. Um, when you write a novel, um, you move to, to southern Italy coming from a completely different background, supposing he had mm. having an education mm, for a woman, which is completely different from what the, what the ladies there had. Um, did you feel um, kind of a conflict uh, living uh, in the society? Um, and did you behave differently in the house than outside? Yes. I've always believed that, that women are not stupid. And even if they have this male authority, they keep together. They try to protect each, each other and help each other behind the man's back. <laughs> so that's what they, that's what they told you. <laughs> yes, that's what they told you. And I saw that if they were short of money, they would sell some of the family's oil to another woman and take the money for them. I mean, all these kind of things. <laughs> but you, with your husband, you behave, let's say, as a Norwegian. Well, I... In the house, because outside you certainly couldn't have shown what... Uh, what... Well, we had our role. Every family has to find its own solutions to how to, 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 to treat each other. And we have found our role that he was the bread taker and I was taking mm -hmm. care of of the house and the children and also of course trying to help him. If I made an, an observation that I thought was interesting, mm -hmm. I would tell him. So we have this kind of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it was a the, the previous day when I met the students in Toronto and they showed a photograph of, of the twins, the four-year-old twins. You came there, sat there and you told the girls to go out in the street and, and play. Find and somebody to play with. Huh? Yes, find somebody to, to play with, yeah. like they used to do in Norway. And immediately somebody was on the door with the twins. Oh, they have run away. So this was not the way to, 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 to deal with children. They were not to, to be let loose in the streets. And perhaps you got a bad reputation for us, bad parents, just letting them go. <laughs> so of course, they always meet the ways um, our, what we are used to will always be challenged when we come to a different culture, even if it is at that time it was in Europe, it was in the Christian Europe, um, but still a lot of differences. And I think that will be for any community that uh, you're not familiar with, they will be always be challenged culturally in, in other ways and, and about behavior. I think, uh, yes. Uh, did you speak the language? Yes, we had. Yes. She still does. No. <laughs> you have learned Italian before you went there? Yes. Okay. And we learned more when we were there. But they couldn't speak. They could, of course, speak Greek, which we couldn't. Mm -hmm. And they had their own dialect. But they also, also learned high Italian mm -hmm. in, in school. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank. Uh, 
Matteo Fazzi for, for hosting this event, uh, Ambassador, for, for coming here, sharing this with us and, and uh, all the rest of you. It has been, uh, I said it was, it must have been, an, it, it seemed like an adventure when we went doing field work in 1966, but this has also been an adventure since Moritz wrote to me and asked about who. Do you think I can get somebody, do, will I have, get permission to, to make use of this manuscript and translate it into Italian two years ago? After that we have re-lived Bova, we have had meetings in, in Trondheim with students and stuff and also here at, at, uh, very appropriately at, uh, at the Italian Cultural Institute. So thank you very much and I think there are drinks and, and uh, things there we can, can continue our conversation there. Thank you. Madonna, whose image is that of a patiently suffering woman. But, as previously assumed, family life is a question of realpolitik. Personalities may, within certain limits, be culturally modeled to fit particular <coughs> systems. But I do not believe that the spirit of freedom can be killed completely in normal human beings in any culture. If no doubt open expression, it may by various detours be sublimated in ways which are culturally acceptable, if not positively accepted. It may seep out in secret magical rituals or psychosomatic symptoms by which the oppressed might terrorize, terrorize their rulers. In more recognizable forms, it may be known in subtle grumbling and gossip. The art of passive resistance the women, mm -hmm. and civic disobedience was, I believe, developed within the family long before it was exploited as a weapon in politics on a larger scale. In the Calabrese household, all these techniques mentioned above are used. The wife will often seek to influence her husband with magic rather than argument. One also could not help being struck by the high number of so-called esaurimento among women. Esaurimento is a blanket term the calibres use to donate nervous ailments of various sorts, from chronic headaches to depressions. Men were also victims of Isarimento, but although I have no statistic of its occurrence, of, I have no a statistic of its occurrence, it was obviously much more common among women than among men. In several household, households, households, wives made life miserable both for themselves and their families through unpredictable spells of Isarimento. So, the so-called victim, its rebellion is not possi uh, possible uh, because uh, the wife has uh, to stay at uh, what wives are doing. Uh, she has to obey and uh, she has to be patient and she can't do anything. And anything. So she has to find another, another way, uh, which is culturally accepted and put uh, on the and this is not something somebody does consciously, but unconsciously. Thank you very much. Uh, um, you may have some questions, comments in, in plenary, but also our host, Director Matteo Pazzi, Invites us for the uh, drinks here. It's possible to, to go there and, and mingle and, and talk about this. But before that, you can have some questions. Uh, just one question: uh, Why is it called Montevarese oh, okay. when you always talk about Bova or Bovesi? Or is it a nickname, or is it uh, to? I think I'm able to, to answer that because uh, uh, Budi showed us a photograph of um, uh, Pietro Varese. He was at the time of the field work, perhaps 10, 12 years old. 
No, he, he was there at the presentation. He also has a chapter in the Italian edition. Le Vare is a family. Became very important for as, as informers, as friends, uh, for the Berger family during the fieldwork. And um, as um, yeah, to try to, to, to make not not to to make the, the place more anonymous than than placing it on a map, uh, and also to honor the the Varese family. He called he, he named the book after the Varese family, Monte Varese. Now in in Volkutenland, uh, the the edition of the um, the edited volume from based on the. Um, this is uh, the articles from, from the news address of Eastern, and the release to, to Bova in 2000. In that chapter, he, he says Bova, he, he names also his informants, he also explains the name Monte Varesa. So it was honoring the Varesa family, and, and uh, it's a bit of a name. <laughs> and, but today you know that uh, the Varesa family. What, what is, a bit surprising is, is in, in Volkutenland, uh, in the 2000 article, that he writes so much about uh, uh, Pietro Varese and the uh, Vendetta and the killings and so it's... Uh, but uh, we know that uh, Pietro Varese, the one who was spent many years in prison on behalf of his brother, actually did, did uh, kill him. Um, he has been open about it, he has been writing about it himself. So it's uh, also very long into it. Uh, so in the book, the original book, the name Bova is not ever mentioned. No, it's not mentioned, but it's uh, the location or, or the region is there, so we know about where it is, but the exact town or village is not uh, identified. Mm -hmm. Yes? I had a question from Mrs. Brigger. Yes. When you drove the Calabria yes. in 1966, did you have an idea? That's interesting because uh, Jan Breger, most of his work, it was very much concerned about the family as an institution. If it was in Ita Italy, in Norway, in, in Ethiopia, or in Portugal, it was a lot about how families kept together or didn't keep together, and how. But they also had a very close eye or analytic view on how the, mm, the pressures, the, the uh, uh, what you call it, the cracks in, in family life, what, what, what is expected culturally and also socially, and how do you vent conflicts. So in some institutions, like Moritz just showed us from the book, where, where ah, there are no mm, real, like today in Norway, if a wife or a husband is dis dissatisfied with, with their partner, we just tell it and then perhaps say goodbye and find somebody else. But in a society, we cannot do that.